If the creed we profess includes an explicit reference to the church as an object of faith, there is no doubt that we need to recognize where, in the variety of self-proclaimed Christian groups, the only true church of Christ is found. A safe way, widely used by apologetics since the time of anti-Protestant disputes, is to resort to the four essential notes of the church present in the niceno constantinopolitano symbol. I believe in the one, holy, Catholic and apostolic church. These notes are not only inseparable properties of the church, but also distinctive signs or marks that allow anyone in good faith to recognize that the only true church can only be the Roman Catholic, since they are only fully and indisputably present in it the characteristics that, by definition, belong to the mystical body of Christ, namely, unity, holiness, Catholicity and apostolicity. The Catholic Church, in the first place, is one, not only because it is unique, that is, there is no other church besides it, but also because of the unity of faith, cf. mt 28, 18, 20, lk 24, 47, the same for all the faithful. For the unity of government, centered on the supreme authority of the Roman Pontiff and, under him, of the entire episcopate. And for the unity of sacramental rites, cf. MT 28, 19, LK 22, 19, JN 3, 5. It follows that, when we pray for the unity of the church, what we are asking is that Christian community separated from Rome by schism or heresy unite again with the only Catholic Church, which is always and essentially one and only one, even if some members are excluded from it. In this sense, the church is like Christ's seamless road, always whole, always whole, without division or separation. It is we who, through our fidelity or infidelity, can be in greater or lesser communion with her. Her unity, therefore, is always the same, perfect and indissoluble. Ours, however, can grow more and more, according to the Lord's desire, that they may be one, as we are one J.N. 1722. This unity of the body of Christ, finally, refers not only to the visible and institutional realities of the militant church, on earth, but also to the suffering, in purgatory, and triumphant, in heaven, members that integrated and, in it, they form one Christian family. Furthermore, the church is essentially holy, with a perfect holiness that in no way diminishes or tarnishes due to the miseries and imperfections of the faithful. For this reason, expressions of the type holy and sinful church should be firmly rejected, since, despite all the sins that are given to us, members of the church, the church never sins or betrays her divine spouse. It is we who, when sinning, cease to be fully church, whose purity is not lost by the filth of those who deny it or voluntarily remove it. The church is holy, moreover, because in her there will always be holiness and examples of heroic charity. Indeed, there has never been a time when the church did not have perfect souls, committed to all kinds of service for the love of Christ, consecrated to him entirely, ready to sacrifice their own lives for the glory of heaven. Finally, the church is holy because her sacraments, her teachings, her discipline, her worship are holy and sanctifying. The Catholicity of the church, in turn, manifests itself above all in the integrity of this doctrine received from the apostles without the partiality or the distortions of heresies. In this sense, the church is Catholic, that is, universal, because it believes and teaches the totality of what the apostles believed and taught. The Catholicity of his teachings is also linked to the Catholicity of his mission. The Church, in fact, was founded by Christ to transmit all evangelical doctrine to all peoples, without loss or audition. It is also Catholic because it brings together nations from all over the world under the unity of one faith, one doctrine and one government. Hence, it can be seen that the notes of unity and Catholicity are mutually demanding, forming a single and homogeneous block. In fact, Christ wanted a Church for the whole world and spread throughout the world. Therefore, there cannot be, according to the mind of Christ, unity that is not Catholic one. Finally, the Church is epistolic, as already indicated, because epistolic is her faith, that is, because the set of truths that Christ entrusted to the apostles in them, according to the mandate to preach the gospel to every creature, always remains uncorrupted. Bequeathed to their successors, the bishops.
For this reason, the epistolicity of faith demands, as a way of perpetuating itself in time, the so-called epistolic succession, through which it is possible to verify, through the links of an uninterrupted chain, the faithful transmission, from bishop to bishop, of the word of the apostles and the rights and obligations that they transfer to their successors in the government of the one church founded by Christ.